So um, today, uh, in today's session, we just have a single uh, discussion panel, um, research on the go. I'll be handing over to Peter in a minute, who will be uh, introducing the rest of the panelists and himself. Um, Please do note that um, that we have a, a code of conduct on these sessions. That goes for the uh, the panelists as well as the uh, the audience. Um, nothing unusual, nothing you wouldn't expect in there, but uh, just a note to uh, to um, you know act in a way that you would want other people to act towards yourself. And uh, and and please do anybody who feels like they are. Um, feel uncomfortable or the, the code of conduct is not being obeyed then please do get in contact with myself uh, privately via the chat if you like and, uh, and we will look into that um, otherwise yeah we're mostly just getting stuck into this discussion panel today um, a few words about our other upcoming events sources a uh, international series of events so we have some really interesting stuff coming up about uh, how France handles RSEs and why there isn't a big RSE movement in France because they've already kind of got it sorted apparently um, as well as various other EU in initiatives and dealing with your um, research software communities and um, this is um, this is only some of the content that we've got coming up. Um, we have we're just looking now at scheduling the remaining content from our last round of submissions. Uh, so there'll be a few more events filling out the schedule in the in the next week or so. Um, but please do uh, take a look at our uh, our website uh, and um, feel free to sign up to our mailing list for uh, notifications about our upcoming events. Um, just a very quick note about this event. Um, so this event is being recorded and uh, we, we publish this online along with the recordings of all our other events. Um, oh, I half finished a sentence there. Oops. Um, this will be uh, this this uh, will also be uh, appearing uh, as the episode of a podcast, which Peter, I'm sure, will mention in just a minute. Um, so just a note that, uh, you know, if you don't want to feature in this recording, then just make sure you keep your videos off, your microphones muted, and you won't be recorded. Um, the contents of the Zoom chat and the Q&A function is not recorded, so you can put questions in there. Uh, and then I think questions will be, will be read out and put to the panel by Peter as well. So just a note on that. I think that's about all I want to say. So I hope you enjoy the session very much, and I will hand over to Peter. Thanks very much, Chris, um, and thanks very much for the introduction. And today's theme is research on the go. Uh, my name is Peter Schmidt. I'm a research software engineer at the University College in London. And uh, I think we, well, not I think, I know we've got a very exciting panel today. But before we do, uh, just a few opening remarks. So first of all, as Chris mentioned, this is going to be a recorded session, not only for Saucy, but I would also like to publish that later on in the year as a podcast episode. So hence there are no slides because this is audio only. Uh, the podcast show is the one that has been launched earlier this year, uh, Code for Thought. And um, yes, so in order to make sure that your questions get captured, I will read them out loudly. And hopefully we will get we'll be able to get through all of the questions that you're asking, depending on how many there are, of course. And, uh, but I will have to read them out, so otherwise people won't be able to see what kind of questions were asked when they listen to the podcast later on. So before we start, um, also a few opening remarks about why um, mobile applications in general, why are we talking about this? And people may think that mobile applications don't necessarily lend themselves for research or for science or in a research and science environment. But actually, that is hardly true anymore because the power of mobile devices, whether it's a phone, a tablet, or anything else, or wearables, has increased by quite a bit. And also, uh, groups are now increasingly, like, for instance, UCL, and I believe Manchester, and Newcastle and possibly the group that you're working in are getting increasing demands from users, from researchers to actually produce mobile applications. So this is a very relevant discussion that we're having, but there are also a few gotchas that I hope we will be able to touch on in today's session. And so without further ado, let's just start. And I would like to invite the panel to introduce themselves 
So um, maybe we can start with you, Adrian. Yep. Hi. So I'm Adrian Harwood. Um, so, so my background, I've probably spent the last 10 years um, in university research. So I went through the whole academic system from a PhD student to a postdoc and then ultimately to a lecturer. Um, and my, my field of research was in and around computational fluid dynamics uh, in aerospace engineering. Uh, most of my the code I wrote during that time was in C, C++, Java, CUDA for GPUs, OpenGL. And I moved to the RSC team in Manchester about two years ago, uh, initially to manage all the mobile and uh, GPU related projects that they get into the team. Uh, but having arrived, it, it's, uh, it was clear that um, the job was much bigger than we initially led to believe. So it changed my role significantly. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Uh, Patricia, yeah, you're working with Adrian, I understand, in Manchester. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Um, unlike Adrian, um, I've got a background in computer science. Um, I have many years in both private and uh, public industry. And then I first got involved in research software um, as a Java contractor at AstraZeneca on the Genomic Initiative in 2001. Uh, found that very interesting. I then came to Manchester University, worked in a proteomics laboratory, again in, in research software, and started with Adrian uh, at the onset, really, of, of MDS in May 2019. So I've sort of had a different, always a computing background, not really done much research until I got involved at those stages, um, and never looked back, really, really enjoy working in research. Okay, finally, we are leaving uh, the University of Manchester and move swiftly over to the University of Newcastle to Mark Turner. Mark. Hey, uh, so my name is Mark Turner and I lead the research software engineering team at Newcastle. Uh, my background is, has always been in computing. Um, I did uh, my undergraduate and then uh, left research to go into industry, did a few years there uh, and quickly realised I preferred research. So I came back, did an MSc uh, at Newcastle and um, one of my supervisors then offered me a, a job as a software engineer or would later become a research software engineer. This is before the phrase was such a thing. Um, and then um, over time built up my expertise and slowly uh, started building up a team uh, that's been very successful to the point where uh, I don't write an awful lot of code these days because I've got a, a team to do it for me. So it's so much the better, I, I would say. <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much for the, uh, for the uh, quick introduction. Um, the theme for today is mobile applications. And when I listen to your background, uh, none of us here on the panel actually have a background specifically in mobile app development, but yet you got into mobile app development. So how did that happen? Do you want me to go first? Stick with the same order? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess, I guess I got into it really because it was, it was a direct... Uh, it was a direct result of the research that I did. So, so my field of research was um, what we called interactive real-time fluid simulations. So basically what this means is it's, it's trying to simulate things like air and water uh, physics, but doing it in real time and doing it in a way that a user can do what's called computational steering, which is to be able to change a simulation's parameters as it's running through things like touch screens and virtual reality and that kind of thing. Uh, so I spent most of my research just sort of writing Android apps and writing solvers and visualization and shaders and things for basically doing the doing the simulation bit on GPUs and some bits of um, uh, bits of visualization and then combining that inside an Android app um, of which you know you needed to know uh, the Android SDK. So if you wanted to do things like um, you know have it respond to um, device orientation or something like this, if you're using essentially a gravity vector or something, you need to tap into the device sensors. Uh, I also, so I published a few papers on this, but one of them was basically where we actually had a cluster of these devices where they they did like a kind of a, um, a, a they computed the, the simulation across like a peer-to-peer -peer bunch of them. So we had like four tablets all number crunching a portion of the, of the simulation. And it was quite cool, but obviously you, need, you end up writing an app essentially, and then just kind of embedding your physics solver inside it. Um, so I, I basically, I made the move to, to realize that I just wanted to write, I enjoyed writing the app more than I enjoyed doing the, the numerics of the, uh, and the mathematics. So that was, the rest is history, I suppose. 
Uh, but when I arrived in 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 the RSE team, it was quite clear that the demand for mobile apps was such that it needed a proper formalized service with governance and the rest of it to be able to um, to, to make that work and make it scalable. Mm -hmm. So that's what the job became. Patricia. Yeah, so, so I got um, into writing apps because uh, so about six or seven years ago, I did a full-time master's in advanced computer science. And one of the modules was mobile development. And I really enjoyed it. And um, I did that as part of my actual project as well, along with smartwatch development. And then um, I managed to get a full-time uh, permanent position with the RSE team. And Adrian and somebody called Joshua Woodcock happened to do an open road show. And it coincided with me starting on RSE. And he just had such enthusiasm and it, and it just sounded interesting and fun. And I thought, right, well, I really fancy going on that team then. And I enjoyed the mobile. So um, I expressed an interest and just jumped at the chance when I was able to, to start on, on the MDS team. Mm -hmm. Mark? Um, so I came at it from a slightly different direction, given my uh, background is in web development, uh, especially sort of user interface design. Um, so I was doing uh, websites around the time where there was this big push to be what would later became sort of mobile first in terms of a responsive design. So I'm only talking about user interface elements at this point. Um, and then we got a couple of projects where people wanted that plus some interaction with the sensors, uh, most commonly like the camera. So it's, it's a case of can we have a mobile website that can also take photos? So it was that gradual uh, move into mobile app development, but via web technologies, which is, I guess, different from the others. Yeah, and no, I guess my background is a little bit different because, I mean, I started at uni, but um, if I may throw that in for good measure, uh, but I went into the industry, I actually developed uh, mobile apps at a company called, <clears throat> excuse me, Mendeley. Mendeley used to have, I still has mobile apps. And I was responsible for the iOS team there and the Android team built that. And so it was actually sort of a product rather than a research project that I worked in there. So I was quite surprised actually, which is bringing me to the next question because um, when I worked in the industry, sort of mobile apps for me traditionally were, you know, you wanna reach as many people as possible. Um, uh, companies obviously want to make money and you know, the reach matters. But also they're long lived and um, research projects very often tend to be transitory, right? So they're limited to a few months or possibly a few years, depending on the size of the project. So why do you think that we need actually mobile app in a research field? Well, I mean, I think I, I would start the discussion by saying that um, I don't, I don't think it's entirely accurate to say that, you know, research projects are, are, sh are short lived. I, I think that there's several apps that were developed, not, you know, pre, pre, pre date our team that uh, were developed mm. um, that are still going now and we still maintain. And, and, you know, you're looking at the best part of, you know, a decade really, sort of six, seven, eight years that those apps have been available. And usually these are associated with like citizen science type projects where they've got a rolling research grant to keep processing data and keep gathering data. And, and those apps, I think, are, are quite long term. I think it's true that there are some projects where they need an app for a single study and that study has a finite window in which it's run, you know, and, and the thing is developed, mm. deployed, used, and then disposed of within 12 months. But I don't think it's universally true. I think I think the, the key that we do in our team is that we're, we're very flexible. So we kind of have it, we're set up to be able to do whatever length of development, maintenance, support as is required by that particular research group. Yeah, I think we've done our apps sort of range between three to 12 months, really. Um, like Adrian said, it, it really depends on the need of that particular study or want and sort of what grant money they've got available to them uh, and when they need to go live for example sometimes we need to get things out quickly more quickly if they need to go out by a certain school term or something 
Um, but and then again, the maintenance can be they might not want any maintenance or they can want it for years. I think we're sort of geared up to, to support any sort of range of app from very small to, to longer term ones. Mm -hmm. What about Mark? I would echo that. I think um, really this is a, a problem that transcends mobile. So I think you're really talking about most research projects. We certainly have the same problem with um, like deployment of web apps. Um, there's still the ongoing maintenance after the grant ends. You still have to find some funding to keep the lights on the server and all that kind of stuff. And this is the same problem with mobile apps. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the parameters are slightly different. So in our case, we uh, would um, try and draw a distinction between which bits of the stack we're supporting and maintaining and which we can palm off to sort of other groups within the university. The classic example being Newcastle has uh, sort of an institutional account with the app stores. So I don't have to worry about paying the bill every year just to keep an app in the store, but I do have to worry about if there's some security vulnerability that I need to make sure the app is patched. But so long as I can um, do that, I don't have to worry about the money and the app stores and all their various rules in terms of conditions. It's, it's handled for me. So um, that division of who's responsible for which bits of the maintenance, both the code and the sort of all the, the gubbins that goes around running a mobile app is, is split up quite nicely. So we've got the first question actually in about uh, app store management, which uh, I will defer to just a little bit later and we're getting to that point actually that's definitely on the list um, so there is a need for um, uh, mobile apps in research so that's clearly what I'm hearing I'm seeing that also at UCL so uh, what's the demand actually look like uh, so from your perspective how much of that is coming in is it more that you can handle is it just about enough and uh... <laughs> so I mean, I can, I can answer the situation of how it's developed for us over the last couple of years. So I, when I first joined, there was, you know, maybe one active mobile app that needed looking after and a couple of requests for them. So it was, it was very much manageable by one person. And, and, and when I booted up the, the mobile development service, um, there was essentially like booting up a startup company. There was me as the only developer and the service lead. So I just kind of did everything for the first mm. six months. Um, and thankfully, Patricia joined uh, because by the time she did, we were seeing around about one new app request every month. Um, so mm. in the first year of the service, we built 12 apps. So that's the equivalent of kind of one a month with only kind of one and a half people in the first year. Um, and I guess it's not really one and a half since half my time was managing the thing anyway. Mm. Um, and in year two, well, we're not we're not at the end of year two of the service yet, but we've already done ten, and we've got six more in the pipeline that are due to be to be started. So you're probably looking at least a dozen apps a year uh, that we do, and, and that's only rising. So from, from our perspective, uh, we've had to take on another another developer mm -hmm. as well. So there's there's three of us that do it now, um, and it's it's just ne it seems to be never ending. Really, I think it's it seems to be a word of mouth type thing. Um, so you, d you do a good job for one person and then they tell their colleagues and then you get another request and, and so on. So it sort of grows mm -hmm. like that, really. Yes, and they, they, we also have repeat orders as well where they actually have come back and wanted to extend their existing app and have grander mm -hmm. ideas on what to do. Um, and Adrian's also sort of expanded the services that we give on our team. We don't just do a full development from A to B, from onset of requirements right through to testing and release. We also do different levels of service. Um, so if people just want them releasing by us, we can do that. Or if they want support and they want us as consultants, we, we have support apps where they, you know, we'll just mentor people and see them once a fortnight or a week and have a weekly meeting and give them input and sort of, so we've got work in different areas as well as doing you know for the for the full blown app as well so we've got quite a mm -hmm. lot of different types of work going on my what's it like yeah, for you from, from the newcastle side we're obviously a long way behind manchester both in terms of size and scope of the rsc team and our involvement in mobile apps i think we're starting to see uh, a rising trend of people inquiring about it um but it's mm -hmm. not yet at the levels where it's sort of one a month um but i think that will we'll definitely get there. Um, we're seeing um, requests. The sort of most interesting thing to me is less the 
volume at the moment um, and more about where they're coming from. Um, so at the moment, I've got conversations ongoing with academics where they're talking about getting funding for something in all three of Newcastle's faculties. That's sort of the engineering, uh, the medical sciences and the humanities. And we would build more about in all of those. It's not like one particular research domain is driving demand. It's really uh, everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. I think we're now ready to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty bit of things because there's a little bit more involved than just writing code when it comes to mobile app development because usually you deploy them say to the app store whether it's google uh, store or the app store uh, or the apple app store and there is ongoing maintenance right there's the annual os updates uh, bug fixing there's responding to user feedback um there's also a question about the distribution of apps so you can actually go there to the app store and uh, or you can actually do that in different ways, like for instance, testing uh, and beta testing, deployment logistics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also, of course, the um, question of user interface design. So I'd be keen to find out a little bit more how you guys handle all of that, because there's looks to me, and from my experience, there's quite a bit more involved than, you know, you write your standalone application. There are lots of add-ons actually to manage and take care of. Yeah, so I, definitely. I mean, I think one of the slight, maybe the slight differences we have to Newcastle is uh, we're actually responsible for deploying our own apps. Um, so, so, so you know, we have we have a, a, a sort of app, what they call an app manager or an admin type account on the store. So, so the the actual the actual app store and, and Play Store accounts are, are, are owned by. IT services um, at Manchester, but research IT of which my team sits is part of IT services. So um, we, we have a naturally a devolved um, privilege to be able to directly deploy our apps ourselves. Um, now that, that's a both a blessing and a curse because um, it, it means that yes, our, all of our processes can be completely joined up end to end. Um, but at the same time, as you say, it's a, it's that added responsibility because we, we are also responsible for the governance process of, um, you know, which I think one of the questions actually touches on this is, is you know, how does ethics play a part in, in app release? And essentially, this is part of a governance process that, you know, I, I have to look mm -hmm. after in, in my role. So you kind of have to be a, you know, a, t a service lead, a project manager and a technical expert all at the same time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just what the jobs become and, and the way the responsibilities are defined. So, yeah, we, we have a lot of responsibility in the team, but sitting inside IT services means all that joins up nicely. Um, it ties in nicely with the governance aspects of, of, of research software. Um, we've recently expanded our remit to include teaching as well. So we have a, a parallel process for the governance of teaching, learning, and students apps. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just a growing, a growing remit. But uh, with that becomes just added responsibilities and bigger, bigger processes, wider processes that we have to look after. Right, Patricia, anything to, to add from your end? Yeah, ju just that really that there is an awful lot to it, which is probably going into the challenges of working on this team, but sort of. Part of this process is due diligence to make sure that they, what we're releasing with the apps, that, that they're good apps and they've been tested properly. And that that's one of the problems of ensuring um, that we we release only apps that have been tested on lots of different variety of devices um, and that they've taken into account things like accessibility, which is very important. And certainly we've had some technical issues with the stack. We, we use Xamarin where there are some bugs to do with accessibility and mm. we've just had to make sure that we're very transparent and open on, on what things we're able to meet and what things uh, uh, we've had to let go. So there's a lot of sort of governance in how we release our apps and like Adrian says, quite a lot of responsibility as well. And there's, there's just an awful lot to it, not just developing. On the technical side of developing an app, it's everything around it. There's an awful lot of work involved, yeah. And the setup of the whole, whole process, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a lot to it. Mark? Yeah, um, I don't have too much to add on all of this, the bits you guys have talked about already. I, I would add for the sort of um, 
user interface design point that you asked, uh, we mm -hmm. would use um, like third party libraries to, to give you that leg up to, to try and do things in the right way rather than build things from scratch. Um, just like common components and, and building blocks that you can put together that are going to give you uh, a hand with those accessibility features and things like that. So you've almost got to try really hard to do it wrong. Um, and these tools are quite useful for uh, holding your hand and getting you to do it, things the right way. Um, and after that, it's really just re repeating what you've both said. It's just a long process, isn't it? A long uh, pipeline from uh, from code base to, to release. Um, there's, there's not much glamour in there. There's nothing uh, <laughs> particularly exciting, but it all needs doing. Yeah, no, but... I think one thing that uh, strikes me is the kind of governance aspect and uh, of course the organization aspect because I've been there now several times uh, previously in the company now with UCL where like University of Manchester we're part of a IT service department and therefore we deploy to the enterprise account to Apple right which is uh, of which we're now part of and we have the proper uh, privileges to actually create apps and maintain our own apps and certificates, but it is a little bit of a kerfuffle. So when people think about deploying their own applications, and uh, thank you for highlighting that, there is actually quite a lot more to sort out, right? So there is also what I quite appreciate that you mentioned, Patricia, the testing aspect, because it's not enough to really test things on a simulator. You really need to get it out on the hardware. And so, yeah, and there are a couple of solutions available. I'm not quite sure what you're taking, but so for instance, there are device farms out there where you can sort of hire some service and then you deploy an application. You can bring it out on different, and particularly for Android where there's far more than an iOS, but even iOS is not that straightforward anymore. So how do you handle that? So how do you do the testing pipeline? I mean, how do you make sure the thing works on all these various different device times and form factors? So, so I, just just before I answer that question, I just wanted to mention one thing more on the on the UI design thing um, is that I should say that for all our projects, um, quite often the, the the customer who is the researcher quite sometimes just doesn't care about UI design. They just say, "Look, I just don't really care what it looks like," and and ultimately we we just have to make a call, and and I think that we. As a team, we, we, we try best to stay on top of things like um, uh, the material design guidelines. So, you know, mm. we, we, we use those resources quite frequently to, you know, to, to just check how we're laying things out. Um, and, and, you know, yes, we, we end up having to do the UI design ourselves uh, with, with wireframes before we build the app, of course, you know, we okay. do that design first. But we also have an option in Manchester to farm the UI design side out to marketing and comms and they will do it for us because they're proper graphic designers um, mm -hmm. but it, the proviso is that they we give them a slice of the budget and that's obviously something that the researchers quite often don't want to give up a slice of their budget for UI design so they're quite happy for us to just use our best mm -hmm. uh, in terms of testing then um, we actually are quite fortunate because being part of IT services we have access to an Azure subscription so we actually use the what's called the Xamarin Test Cloud, mm -hmm. which is essentially a, a room full of physical devices mm -hmm. that you can run automated tests on. Um, and the, the, the tech stack we use, the Xamarin Tech Stack, has a UI test uh, NuGet package that's essentially a, a variant on uh, NUnit. And you can write unit tests and you can write UI tests in your app and basically just deploy them to the test cloud. So you, you, you can test on 200 plus devices mm -hmm. uh, in, in our case two at a time you know overnight and you've got your results by the morning so but yeah. that implies also some kind of automated testing level doesn't it yes it's, it's automated i mean we mm -hmm. obviously do what we can manually and part of our we also have a user acceptance testing procedure uh, we use the beta test facilities and test flight on the store accounts so that essentially i, th I think patricia you, you, you'd agree with me here that we do so much testing <laughs> before the app goes into production, automated and manual, um, that that I don't recall as ever having a post-production bug that we have to fix. You see, the, the problem is that 
that um, some of the apps that we do are, are relatively small, so they haven't got the budget because if you're writing mm -hmm. using a unit and these automated tests, sometimes you can actually double the development time because you have to write the test, then you have to test it. Then if you're using Agile and you go back and forth with the sprints, they change their mind and we change, you know, we have to adapt to requirements. So then you rewrite the tests. So there's quite a big overhead with actually introducing and there's a cost, you know, there's a monthly cost for the subscription. So that all, when, when Adrian's doing quotes on that, we all have to take that in um, sort of into consideration of whether or not it's worthwhile for a very straightforward app to actually go to that extent. But then, mm. so if it's a, if it's an app that they want to, to run for the, another 10 years or whatever, we would definitely have to do it. And it was out to a, a wide variety of the public. But if it was only for a small cohort of people and we knew the devices, we would then probably, and it was a simple, straightforward mm. app, we probably then wouldn't go to that extent of doing the automated testing. Again, if there's a bug that we, so we, if it's released and there's a bug that we can't reproduce on the emulators, we, you know, me and Adrian only have a single Android device each and we're using our own apple phones to test because we work for the university so it's very restricted so this is part of the process when we're talking to people of what is important for them in their app whether they want extensive testing on 200 plus different devices and operating systems or whether mm, they want to focus mm. on getting something good fit for purpose within their grant means but as adrian has said testing is just massive all the way through you know user acceptance testing our own mm. testing peer testing beta testing once it goes into release and then obviously the maintenance and any testing if there's any bugs that we put right so it's a massive part of, of our process I, I guess we have a we have a minimum standard don't we so we say yeah. that you know everything has to be tested on the yeah. latest os the yeah. earliest os that you support uh you know both you know, phones tablets anything any kind of combination but there's kind of a minimum subset of, yeah. of physical device tests that we do and we insist mm. every app is put through but you know it, as patricia said it's a sliding scale there's anything upwards from that minimum really you've got to judge whether it's worth the the, the budget and whether the budget's available. Mm -hmm. Mark, uh, any comments from you? Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have that level of rigor with app development just because we don't do enough of it. I think it's a function of not having a dedicated mobile app person. Um, we would typically just test on physical devices and a lot of the mobile development we've done has not been meant for um, like mass participation it's been um to be run by a couple of researchers on their devices um and it's not like a citizen science type thing or anything like that where you've got to worry about those things um so yeah we would play a little uh, fast and loose with the what devices we're targeting um and just do it that way we've had projects where the thing we've actually been building is really a prototype to strengthen um, a funding application where you're then going to rebuild the app and do it properly and it that really has been sort of like quick and dirty it's what can you do in six weeks um just to try and impress the funder so it's got to look mm. like it works even if it doesn't actually yeah I, I did a, a, a bunch of new questions coming in that i would like to answer in uh, or discuss in due course so uh, one of which is actually um a question that i have encountered many many times uh, and I'm sure you have as well, which is the native versus cross-platform. And uh, so I'm pretty opinionated on that one, <laughs> but I'm going to hold back because <laughs> I'd like to get your take on this. So we have, back in the days when I started mobile app development, that was uh, there were more than Android and iOS available. I think Windows was a competitor at the time. And... Uh, uh, and others, um, but now it's more or less boiled down to Android and iOS versions. And so, um, right, uh, rather than just saying, okay, well, uh, I only do a React Native or whatever, or I only do iOS or, or, or Android, what would the criteria be for you to say, okay, I'm going to go native, this is more suitable for native development, and, oh, no, well, hang on, we probably can do this much better uh, for React Native, where where do you actually draw the line, and how do you decide that? Let's start with that. <clears throat> so, I mean, I, so I guess I can. So, I've I've had to make this call. You know, when when we booted up the service, I had to decide what we were going to do. Um, 
So first of all, I should say that we chose a cross-platform framework and I've been very happy with that decision. So I'll start with that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'll also say though, that I don't, I, I don't sit in one camp and firmly. Um, I think we, we've done a couple of projects that have been native. Um, so we did one, uh, Patricia, you'll say a bit more later, maybe about which was written in Java using the Android SDK. So straight written in Android Studio as if you were writing an Android app from scratch. Uh, I did one only a few weeks ago, which was maintaining an app that was written in Objective-C, which is a horrible experience, but um, you know, had to be done. Um, so we, we, we don't insist that apps have to be done partic mm -hmm. one particular way. And obviously my background was writing native Java Android apps. Uh, in fact, even more so is I used to write C code and use Java native interf interface to actually run pre-compiled C libraries. And the reason why I did that is because I needed absolute performance. I was running GPU simulations. I needed every spare millisecond I could get to get the thing running as fast as possible in real time. Um, and in that particular instance, I wouldn't have dreamed of using a higher level of abstraction. I absolutely mm. needed that low level performance. But... I would say that 90% of the apps we get do not need that level of performance. Mm -hmm. What they need is contact with users quickly and efficiently. So what they need is basically what a cross-platform framework brings, which is an efficient way to share code between both platforms. Um, and obviously there are ways to do that. Um, we went with Xamarin, but there's also React Native has been around a long time. Um, Cordova, I believe, is well. Phone phone gap build anyway is being discontinued. Mm. So there's maybe um, it's Cordova now. Isn't Cordova it? is still still about as an alternative. Mm. Um, and when making a decision as to as to which system to use, I had to look at several things. One of them is um, what resources did we have in the RSC team who were essentially going to be the developers? What skills did they have? And how mm. big a change would it be for them to retrain on a new tech stack? What skills did I have, considering I'm supposed to be the technical expert? Um, so essentially, because I knew C, C++, and Java, converting myself to C Sharp to write in Xamarin was a no-brainer. It requires very little effort syntactically. It's very similar. Um, so that made sense. We also have a load of .NET developers in the team. So it made sense to run with a .NET um, framework. So Xamarin is essentially well, next year will soon be rolled into .NET 6. So mm -hmm. essentially it will become the de facto uh, cross-platform mobile framework for .NET. Uh, and and that's, it just makes made sense based on the what we needed to do. And we mm -hmm. probably, based on the level of abstraction that we write our apps, um, we probably get about a 60 to 70% code base share. So that means for every app we write, 70% of the code is packaged into a C sharp .NET standard library, which is shared across the Android and the iOS projects. And then the remaining 30% we write using um, direct C sharp bindings to the SDKs. So you're writing it in C sharp, but the Xamarin.Android and Xamarin.iOS SDKs bind straight to the uh, Swift SDKs and the Java SDKs underneath. So you get 100% of the SDK functionality, you're just writing mm. it in C Sharp. So. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I should, uh, yeah, I would like to chip in right now, but maybe if somebody else would like to say something uh, on that subject. I think Adrian's covered quite a lot, but really probably the only one where we went for the um, just Android and not cross platform was when it was an existing app that the owner wanted to support herself. So wanted it, to, to be enhanced and written in the same language so she could still um, understand it and support it later on. Uh, so, so we did, but as it happens, they do want to go cross-platform. So it prob probably will be continued on in, in Xamarin uh, for future enhancements. Um, but I think it's mainly your skill set, what you've got available and, and what's mm -hmm. quick to produce because cro cross-platform is so much quicker to get apps out on both platforms. I would echo, I think um, we, we've come down on the, the different side of the fence and gone sort of the, the web route like with React Native, and, but it's for the same reasons. It's the skills you have available in the team. Um, a lot of the team are, have a web background, so it makes sense to work in JavaScript or TypeScript. 
Um, I'm working on an app now that's using React Native. Um, and it's the first time I've done much mobile dev in sort of five years or so. And before that, I used PhoneGap. And the one thing that I sort of noticed with that break is just how far cross-platform has come since doing a, a admittedly very old version of PhoneGap. It was just, it was horrible to use then. Now writing in React Native, it's just an absolute breeze. I love it. Um, absolutely, there are, I'm like Adrian, it's a kind of case of right tool, right time, right job. So it, we just haven't had many projects yet that have demanded that native development. Um, it's just not been worth it. It's often for budgetary terms as well. Like it, if you can make efficiencies with cross-platform, it means you can do more with the budget you have from the researcher. If someone comes along with like a five million pound project and they want three, four, five developers, yeah, I might consider native just because you've got time and money to burn, but where you're trying to make efficiency savings in, in research, it's cross-platforms a no-brainer. Right. Uh, is it really a no-brainer? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take <laughs> a different position. So because um, I'm a little bit more on the native camp, which is not to say that I'm against uh, cross-platform. And in fact, um, so when I was at Mendeley, we looked at different tools. Uh, granted, that was a little while ago. It was 2017. We looked at React Native, which came out really on top, along with Xamarin, because they actually bind, as uh, Adrian, I believe, explained, to the underlying native I, uh, uh, um, APIs, right? So in React Native, you have a JavaScript bridge. So you write everything in JavaScript or in TypeScript in React, but then sort of the APIs get sort of addressed directly from the native, um, uh, from the JavaScript bridge. So uh, basically that native aspect is hidden from you in that sense. But in terms of efficiency, so I think, um, my preference more comes from the fact that sometimes there is uh, the belief that it's more effective and more efficient when in actual fact it turns out that maybe as the app progresses and gets more complex, it won't be. So uh, you rely largely on the availability of APIs, sort of the cross-platform APIs that eat into various different APIs of the native system, right? And most of the time that's covered, but then you get the cases where that isn't. And then you actually need to either merge the work that you're doing uh, across platform and doing some native stuff. So you're then actually having that added complexity. And, um, and then you basically uh, don't have to deal with two um, uh, sorry, with one cross-platform only, but then you have to do with cross-platform plus iOS and plus Android. So, uh, and the other thing, of course, is that the deployment of the application is also, um, but we still can't forget that what you're actually delivering are two apps, right? So you're doing a cross-platform app, but it still ends up being an iOS app and it still ends up being an Android app and you still need to deliver it and test it to get it to the app store. So I agree there are some cost efficiency and you know, for straightforward apps uh, across platform yeah, where you're pretty sure that you don't have to eat into some kind of native components that aren't quite covered by the cross platform APIs, then I think that sounds like a straightforward solution. Um, when it comes to uh, something a little bit more complicated then you can actually add complexity rather than reduce it. So that would be my argument. I'd, I'd like to I'd like to uh, to add to that actually because on in in a sense I agree with you but I think it it does it does depend on how your cross platform framework exposes the relevant platforms mm -hmm. I think um, so so Xamarin offers a couple of ways it offers something called a dependency service and it offers something called uh, custom renderers which basically means that you can you can package up your own cross-platform API for the bit that you think is missing. Um, so it's very extensible. And I think the way we've dealt with this in our team is um, when there's been a common call for a particular cross-platform component mm. that doesn't exist, we've, we've just written it ourselves. And then we can add that package, if you will, to the project. So. So we found that actually it has been an efficiency saving because 
we've just extended so that the cross-platform component of Xamarin we use, I should say, is called Xamarin.forms. Mm -hmm. Basically a higher level of abstraction that sits above the platform specific bits. Uh, and if it doesn't exist in forms, we'll just add it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's how we've got around the problem. It's never really added complexity because it is we still maintain that abstraction. Yes, you have to maintain the two platform specific bits, but I'd much prefer 70% shared, 30% platform specific than the other way around. So it mm -hmm. still makes sense to me. But you still need to actually have some knowledge. I, I think sort of the expectation mm. usually is that, you know, I only need to worry about React Native, but the reality is that you actually need to understand at least a little bit about Android and iOS. Absolutely, absolutely. You're mm. absolutely correct. It doesn't save you anything in terms of knowledge of the actual platform APIs mm. and platform SDKs. You absolutely need to know what's going on under the hood. It's just if in terms of de sheer development time, it cuts mm -hmm. down your 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 the speed at which you can put build something if you build it using a cross-platform mm -hmm. API. But it does not. You cannot substitute the platform-specific mm -hmm. knowledge, as Patricia would 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 attest to. You know, you, you join the team, you you have to absolutely know how all the platforms you target work, because mm -hmm. before long you will have to touch those those uh, platform-specific APIs. It's, it's unavoidable. I think we can probably go on around uh, the, the subject for a lot longer, and I'm sure this debate will continue as we go on. But I think what we can all agree on is that cross-platform uh, tools have now come a long way. So as Adrian and Patricia and Mark said, sort of when we started with FilmCut, that was pretty horrible. And I started that sort of many years ago. And it was something to run away from. But nowadays, I think when you do something in React Native and Xamarin, although I haven't worked with Xamarin lately, but React Native certainly, that actually does quite a nice job, actually, and certainly for relatively straightforward apps. That's true. I would like to cover a couple of more um, questions that have been posted here. Um, one of which is going back to um, uh, the, the I'm not quite sure if we can cover all of them. So let me just read them out. Um, one um, listener wonders, how long do you undertake to support apps related to projects to take account of funders, researchers, post-funding expectations on availability of outputs? So I guess that's a question about, so how long can we actually support the app once the funding, or how do we care of the funding post-delivery to the app store? because assuming that the app will have to live a little bit beyond the actual project funding period. How do you take care of that? How do you, how do you lead the conversation with the research teams? Well, I think when Adrian starts to initially talk to the users and, and uh, assess how much we're gonna to quote to, do, to produce the app, he will talk through the needs and do an assessment and see how long the maintenance may need to be. Um, if if, the, if it's a very small grant and they're happy with having none, I don't know, Adrian will go into it, how many we've done like that, but then mostly we will factor in a certain amount, months or whatever, of being available there to put any critical bugs or anything right um, and the longer term maintenance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think, Mark, this might be, uh, this might be perhaps where we differ a little bit uh, from for you operationally, but be, be, because we have a mobile the dedicated mobile development service, and I'm 100% allocated to managing and, and whatnot on that service. And at the moment, at least Patricia is as well, because we have permanent developers, because I guess that's a, that's a point we've not covered actually, is that at Manchester, at least, all the RSCs are permanent, or most of them are permanent staff. So mm -hmm. if we didn't have any research projects, we wouldn't lose our jobs. We're not funded from a research grant. We, we use the money from the research grant to essentially recover our costs, they offset our costs. So it means that we have permanent staff that are in the service to look after maintenance, mm -hmm. which means that we can charge a fee to make sure that a portion of those people's time is allocated per week to look after maintaining released apps. Uh, so because of how we're set up, we, we, we're given the luxury mm -hmm. of being able to do that. And that's all we do. We have a discussion with them and say, how long do you want us to maintain it for? Do you want us to maintain it? What level of support do you want? How much do you want to pay? And then, you know, we agree that in advance. Mark? Yeah, it's, it's sort of difficult. I mean, Adrian's right that Newcastle, the setup is different. And um, 
sometimes even if a researcher was willing to pay sort of a year or two after the fact if we'd not heard from them and then they'd come back with some some bug fix or something sometimes the developers left sometimes things have just changed uh, so it's quite a difficult thing to do um we it's just sort of best effort we do what we can for i always prioritize the the critical bug fixes especially security things um but if it's a case of i don't quite like the the look of my user interface anymore those types of requests are quickly sort of turned down unless they've got budget to pay for it mm -hmm. um the the way i usually handle it is to just make sure the researcher understands um what can happen to apps once they're in the app store so the fact that these companies are constantly checking the, their security policies change their like minimum firmware versions change this kind of thing and I don't make necessarily firm commitments for those researchers that have very small budgets. So we have an example where I did some work for a small group in, in history in a humanities sort of setting. And typically they don't have large research budgets. So I didn't commit to your app will be in the app store for five years, 10 years, whatever. I simply said it will be there as long as it can be there until Apple or uh, Android decide that for whatever reason, it doesn't meet their requirements anymore. And at that point, we have a conversation. If you've got budget, we'll fix it. And mm. if you don't, it dies. But that it's a difficult conversation to have with a researcher, but at least they then go into the situation knowing what's going to happen, that it's not my fault that their app has gone. It's Apple's mm. decision or it's Google's decision. And uh, usually, yeah, they might be disappointed their app's gone, but at least they understand why that happened. and and uh you can disarm them a little bit easier and um, we, we're running out of time so we've only got five minutes left but there are a couple of questions but one of which i think um you might have encountered which is about commercializations of apps i mean that's certainly uh, something that i encountered as a request so there's an app idea and uh you want to bring it to the market, not only as a research team, but then later on potentially productize it. Mm -hmm. So in your experience, how is that going? And uh, how do you deal with questions of ownership, for instance? I've actually done this in both directions. So right. I've done stuff at work and then uh, been involved with a spin out where we've taken um, a mobile app was part of that application, but it was a much bigger sort of cloud based platform. Um, and I've also had situations where I built a mobile app for someone in a freelance capacity, closed that freelance company and effectively gifted the source code to the university so that someone else can maintain it. Mm -hmm. um, in, in practical steps, it's fairly easy because you're just transferring the ownership of the apps in the app stores and uh, the code obviously exists in like GitHub. So you just hand it over. Um, the IP issues I didn't even really involve legal in terms of putting code into the university because I was just happy to hand it over. I'm not making no claim on it. Um, the other way around, we had a, uh, the usual legal meetings where you're trying to form spin out companies, that kind of thing. So the university mm. has its own process for looking at that kind of thing. Right. We've got only three minutes left at maximum. So uh, maybe <laughs> uh, Adrian or Patricia, uh, do you want to chip in? Uh, well, just just a quick one is is we have a what's called a UMIP, which is University of Manchester Intellectual Property. So we have like a kind of team of lawyers who who deal with exactly these kind of IP transfer arrangements. So the mm -hmm. only the only potential complexity we haven't we haven't had this yet, but it's a possibility is if a student writes the app because they don't the university doesn't automatically own the IP mm -hmm. uh, if a student writes it. Right. Um, so, you know, there's nuances, but it's, it's all, you know, there's various university departments, you can seek advice for things like this, if you need to move the, the source code or, or the app either way. Right. Uh, there is one quick question. Uh, do you have any experience on using Dart Flutter for mobile research software? So, so this is, uh, this is Google's um, cross platform framework so i i know of somebody um who has who has been experimenting with flutter in their uh, free time to develop an app cross-platform mm -hmm. app and um from what i can gather is it's basically exactly the same experience of using any new cross-platform framework is that it just takes such a long time for them to 
build the framework up enough, uh, you know, to bind it to enough of the platform level um, APIs and, and deal with all the bugs that, that comes with that, that it's just a very poor experience for, for, for when you're starting off. And I think that's true of literally every single cross-platform framework that exists. Is the, the longer it's been around, the much more better. stable, better experience mm -hmm. you get. And, and I don't quite know why Google saw the need to create their own myself. But anyway, <laughs> I'm late to the party again. Um, okay, well, I'm afraid uh, we have to stop there now because we've run out of time. Uh, I hope that was an interesting discussion. There's lots more to discuss. And um, so reach out to us if you have any more questions. I hope that we were able to answer some of your questions uh, that you have, even if you haven't posted them. Uh, but hopefully we gave uh, good enough answers for the ones that you did. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Chris or Alison. Yeah, so just to say, if you would like to uh, carry on discussing, there is the uh, source chat channel on um, the, the UK RSC Slack. So uh, perhaps the... Uh, Panelists would be kind enough to uh, keep an eye on that and uh, and uh, respond to any questions there if you uh, want to. Otherwise, I'm sure Peter and Co will be able to help out with any other queries you send them. Um, just one very 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 quick note before we wrap up, just to plug our. Uh... Sorry, I hate PowerPoint. Just to plug again our upcoming events, if any of those do sound of interest to you, then uh, please do pop along to this um, the source.github.io site and uh, and check out the program and uh, and sign yourself up for upcoming events. Otherwise, thanks very much for attending today. We, uh, we hope you enjoyed it.